Lisa Sims Booth, welcome to the learning community at the New School at Commonweal. Thanks for having me. We often start with a a poem or a song, and I know you're a member of your church choir. I wondered if you would start us off with a song this morning. I, I would I would be happy to. Um, this is something that we sing, um, and I sing often myself. Um, it's just a song to sort of get me centered, um, and hopefully it'll sort of be a grounding for us all here today. Um, so we'll give it a few bars here. Okay. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Be here with your presence. Fill us with your power. Live inside of me. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Be here with your presence. Fill us with your power, live inside of me. That's so beautiful. It's a, it's a beautiful you. song. Yeah. yeah. What is the name of your church and your choir? So um, I go to Metropolitan AME Church in Washington, D.C., um, which in the, coming up on our 182nd anniversary, it's the, it's the longest Black-owned piece of property in D.C. Um, and so it's really amazing. It's been wonderful to be a part of the congregation. And I sing in, um, my husband is like, I oh, can't believe you're going to say this, but I sing in three choirs. Really? Um, but, the main, well, but the main one is called the United Voices. But then I also sing in the, with the women's choir. And there's another choir that sings sometimes that's also called the Collective but the United Voices is the one I sing in the most. How many people are in that? Oh, I think we're about uh, 30-ish, 30, 35, can kind of ebb and flow. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. And do you practice as well as sing on Sundays? Uh, yes, we practice at least twice a week. Typically, in the previously, we were practicing at least twice a week, and then we sang at least three four Sundays a month. We try to rotate choirs so there's a bit of a break, but at minimum three Sundays a month I was singing. Wow. Yeah. And so what are you all doing with the choir during uh, the COVID time? Well, we are still having choir rehearsal virtually, which has been mm -hmm. wonderful because we all miss each other. When you spend that much time together, the choir is like my other family. And mm -hmm. so I miss them all terribly, but we've been getting together virtually. You can't sing together virtually because of the delay. And so we sing on mute together, but it is the highlight of my week wow. um, when we get together. Wow. And we are starting to do some video recording songs um, that we'll be able to put together as the choir. So we're working on those now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll look into this for you, but a friend of mine who's a musician say that, says that they have an app that enables musicians to play together. Do you know about that? I've heard, I think, I have heard some people talking about that. And our, I know our, my choir director has been talking to some of his other musician yeah. friends too, and they're trying to figure that out. Um, yeah, seems yeah. like a critical thing to be able to not only rehearse together, but also to just join and worship together, you know, in the church that way. Yeah. yeah, no, it's, but, but I have to say, even just seeing each other in little boxes singing together is just like, like I said, yeah. it, it brings me so much joy. Yeah. yeah. Well, Lisa, you are the executive director of Smith Center for Healing and the Arts in Washington, D.C. And I, I just want to introduce the history of it a little bit. Um, uh, one day, I guess about Mm. 25, 27 years ago, uh, a woman named Barbara Smith Coleman called from Washington, D.C. And she, um, her brother had developed cancer and she had taken him to a center 
in Bristol, England, called the Bristol Cancer Help Center. And um, the Bristol Cancer Help Center was a model for us when I was developing the Commonwealth Cancer Help Program about 36 uh, years ago. And so Barbara's brother ultimately died, but she was so profoundly changed by the experience of going to the Bristol Cancer Help Center that she began to look around to see who was doing something similar in the United States, and she found Commonweal. So she called me and she said um, she wanted to start a cancer help program on the East Coast, and would I help her do it? And at that point, I was just overwhelmed with work at Commonwealth. I told her I couldn't do it then, but that we could start a healing arts uh, program together, that we would do um, weekend healing arts retreats. So we joined in doing those. And those were actually uh, with Michael Samuels, Dr. Michael Samuels and others. Those were among the first healing arts uh, events that anybody had known about in recent years. So we did that for several years. And then after that, Barbara, um, uh, again, she decided that even though I couldn't help her yet, she would try to start a cancer help program by herself. So she tried to start a cancer help program by herself and it, it turned out to be very frustrating. And she developed um, a uh, very severe colon cancer and went through terribly rigorous treatment. And um, I should mention here, by the way, that Julia Rowland played a key part in this. She was you know, very close to Barbara. And um, when she recovered from her colon cancer, she came back to me and said, you know, not only do I want to start this, but I want to leave half of my estate to support it. And would you again consider joining me? So I did join her at that point. And, uh, and we actually literally imported most of the staff of the Commonwealth Cancer Health Program to the East Coast. And we started doing cancer health programs there. And we asked Shanti Norris to be the first executive director and uh, I became the president and uh, CEO, and then later simply the president, as Shanti took over being the CEO. And so um, we created Smith Center for Healing and the Arts, uh, and I served on the board for, I think, uh, close to uh, 18 years. Uh, and um, so that's a little bit of the story. Then a wonderful woman that you know, Jennifer Byers, uh, became the executive director after Shanti left. And Shanti did a brilliant job. Jennifer also did a brilliant job. And then uh, she moved, as you know, uh, to, uh, to be executive director of Life with Cancer and Patient Experience for the Innova Shar Cancer Institute uh, with our love and support and blessings. And uh, Jennifer remains a very close friend. So that's kind of the introduction. And then we found you. And uh, we have just been so thrilled with your leadership of Smith Center. So I just wanted to kind of bring the whole context of this, because this isn't like a passing relationship. This is you know, a lineage that starts with Barbara and her husband, Webb, uh, and then um, Shanti and Julia was such a part of it. And then Julia joined us uh, in a senior role at, at Smith Center. Um, so anyway, those are some of the pieces. So what I want to ask you is, how did you come to Smith Center? Tell us about that. Yeah, it's a, um, I think I've shared this with you in my chat during my interview process. Um, uh, I don't know, if, I think Smith Center in a way found me. Um, but mm -hmm. I found Smith Center as well. Um, it goes back a couple of years. Um, I had been working um, in an organization called Faster Cures, which um, is a center of the Milken Institute that was focused on getting to um, 
barriers and getting to cures for diseases faster and what could we do? And I've been working in, in a lot in advocacy, patient advocacy and really the patient voice. And I saw the announcement um, for Smith Center on a Facebook post that a friend had posted. And this was back when Shanti was leaving. And so at that time, it was like, well, that's not four years ago, perhaps five. And I saw it and I thought, oh my God, what an amazing organization. Like I read the description, I went to the website and I was just blown away with what Smith Center was doing. And I'm like, I need to, I, but I was also like, I've been here 14 years. I don't know. I don't know. Long story short, I, I sort of got talked myself into and some pushed myself and some other people helped me to applying. Um, but it didn't quite work out that time. And I ended up taking a job at Biden Cancer Initiative where I worked for the two years. And in the middle of those two years, I met someone in Portland, Oregon, who knew Jennifer. And so she goes, you need to meet Jennifer. And so I met Jennifer Byers, who's the, my predecessor and has now become a, a good friend. And Jennifer and I hit it off and we're talking and, um, and just got to know each other. And I had talked about different ways I may be able to work with Smith Center um, when I was at Biden Cancer. Like we were just trying to figure things out. And, and um, you know, as people know, the, um, the Bidens are, are, are a little busy right now. And so um, Biden Cancer had to um, suspend operation. And so I reached out to a few key people and Jennifer was one of those people to let them know this is what's happening. And she immediately came back and said, you will not believe this, but I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just like, what do you mean you're leaving? And she goes, I'm leaving. And this mm -hmm. position is going to be open. And so here it is two, two and a half years later from that initial moment when I found out about the position and about Smith Center for it to come back full circle. And now I'm you know, unemployed. And so I applied and, um, and went through the um, interview process and here I am. Um, no, and and we, had a wonderful, we, we had a wonderful conversation while you, when you went through the, the interviews. So yes, I got did. to know you then. Yeah, yes, yeah. it was a great conversation. I, I, for people who are in DC, I hope you, you know, will you know, come visit when we are open again. And, and for those who are living out, live in other places, I hope you'll come visit when you are in the DC area. It is a, it is a very special place. And I think you feel that as soon as you cross the doors. Yes, it is. So, um, Lisa, um, we can't ignore the fact that um, not only are we living in this COVID time, but we're also living in the time of the uh, murder of George Floyd, of the of Black Lives Matter, uh, of uh, and that triggered a truly astonishing, not only national, but global response. Really something I don't think I've ever seen in my lifetime, um, anything like it. And so here you are, uh, an African-American woman leading Smith Center. Uh, tell us about your response to it. Oh, there's the image. Uh, we'll just leave that up for a moment. Um, yeah, I just want you all to be able to see that that image. So this was uh, Barbara Smith Coleman's art studio while she was alive. And um, she left uh, the studio as well as half of her estate. Um, uh, uh, to She left the studio to um, Smith Center. And uh, the estate, she created the Barbara Smith Fund, which uh, supports uh, Smith Center in part. But it's really an incredibly beautiful building. And Shanti Norris led a uh, development drive that completely transformed the building. So it's an exquisitely beautiful place in a beautiful part of Washington, very close to DuPont Circle. So I just wanted you all to be able to see it. So, uh, as I was saying, Lisa, how, what was it like for you to go through that period of time? And then how did you decide to respond as the executive director of Smith Center? 
Yeah, that's that's an I, I I'm so glad we're, you're bringing this up, Michael, because I don't think we can talk not talk about it in in, in this moment. No, um, no. I'll speak first personally, just um, as a woman of color. Um, it, the, and there were a succession of things. If you if you think about that moment, we had the situation that happened in Central Park with the um, mm. threat to call the, the police on on the guy Christian Cooper. I think his name was watching birds and whatever he was doing in the park. Yeah. And then we had already had Ahmad Arbery, and then we had Breonna Taylor, and those things were all out there. And then we had the George Floyd incident. And so I can only speak for me, but I was already in a state of like what is happening, what, like, just my, my spirit was, was in, in some pain. Like, I really was very troubled by everything that kept happening. Then George Floyd hit, and I don't typically watch those videos, and I actually really fully haven't seen all of it, but I've seen enough of it that um, that one broke my heart. I, I'll be honest. I, I haven't been as dis- that despondent over seeing something um, in, in, in a, a long time. Uh, just the lack of humanity, the lack of empathy, the lack of regard for another human being, the, it, it broke my heart to see. And, and it reinforced for me just this notion. And what I just kept saying to myself is, why aren't we, as a people of color, as an African-American woman, and, and I think particularly Black men, why aren't we seen as having any humanity by some people? Like that we're not here and have and have the rights to breathe and do all these things that everyone else gets to do, like, and so I just I was uh, really shaken um, to the core by that, and so, and 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 we meet um, I have a wonderful staff at Smith Center, um, and I know a lot of them are on now, and I, I'm blessed to have to work with everyone, and we have weekly staff meetings where we speak both personally as well as work related. And so my, my report out check-in was just like, I am, a, I am not well right now. And everyone else was sort of similarly like, I know this is really hard. And I was grateful that we have enough of a space within the staff that we can speak that way. And so the next staff meeting, this, and then after that, everyone, like, everyone started writing statements. All of a sudden, everybody was coming out with a statement. And so I came back into the staff and said, I want us to talk about what we say as Smith Center. Do we say something? And what should we say? And everyone unanimously was like, we must speak out. We can't be silent. And I was like, great, okay. And I knew that as a woman of color, I wanted, I I was like, we can say something, but I don't want to put out a bunch of empty words. I think they're calling it now like performative advocacy or performative, I can't think of the name right now, but I didn't want to do that. And whatever we said was going to be something that I felt like I could stand that I could stand behind, but I wanted everyone else to stand behind it. So I wrote something and I shared it with every staff member and I asked everyone to let me know what they thought, if they felt good about it. And if they did, once everyone said, I'm good, I agree, this is great, let's go, we, we released it. And, um, and we got a wonderful response from the community. Um, I think people were heartened that we spoke up, but I think we're also heartened that, um, that we, that we set, we not only did we speak for Smith Center, but I actually laid in some personal um, reflections, which really seemed to touch people in a way that I hadn't expected. But I just felt yeah, like I, we couldn't speak. We couldn't speak. I that is me as the executive director. I couldn't not speak some of my own experience to it um, because I think that's just who we are, as Smith Center. We come from the heart, and I felt like this had to come from our collective hearts. But I think people needed to also hear from me. Mm. Would you be willing to read us the letter? Sure. You want me to read the whole thing, or, or read whatever parts you'd like to? But you could read the whole thing, whatever whatever you're drawn to read. Okay. Just okay. Well, I'll read most pick, of it. Pick, yeah. Yeah. Pick what you'd okay. like to read. Yeah. Um, so it starts with dear Smith Center family and wider community. It is with a heavy heart and a weary spirit that I reach out to you today to voice Smith Center for healing and the arts, outrage and sadness around current events. Over the past few weeks, we've had an influx of painful information and images from the impact of COVID-19 on our communities of color and the senseless deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd. Sadly, these are not isolated incidents, but only the most recent examples 
that bring to, bring to light the relentless and devastating impact of institutional and systemic racism across the country. Smith Center for Healing and the Arts, an organization devoted to helping people dealing with cancer and chronic illness condemns these actions and we add our voices to those across the country saying enough is enough. I can't think of a better community of people than ours, a community focused on love and support, living through difficulty and adversity and using art, music and so many other wonderful tools for healing and peace to help at this time. I wrestled with saying anything about my personal experiences, which seems so trivial when others have lost their lives, but it's the daily brushes with racism that tear away at the soul. I'm that little girl that heard repeatedly that I had to work twice as hard at everything because of the color of my skin. I'm that worried wife when my husband is out at night and I hold my breath until the garage door opens. And I'm that shopper who's been followed around stores but never asked if I need help. This is just how it is when you're African-American and that along with the senseless loss of any more lives must end. And then I say, I'm, prou I'm so proud to be the executive director at Smith Center and work with an amazing team of people. We are committed to being part of the solution and not part of the problem. We don't have all the answers, but we are here and we stand at the ready to be a community partner and ally to help bring change in DC. I leave you with the words of one of my favorite songs written by the legendary Dr. Bernice Johnson Reagan and sung by Sweet Honey in the Rock. And the song is Ella's song dedicated to one of my sheroes, Ella Baker. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. And then I end, we end it with take gentle care and let's get to work. And it's signed by me. Oh, Thank you. That's Sister. so beautiful. Let's just go into silence for a minute and just absorb that and just sit with it. Such a beautiful letter. Peace, peace. Lisa, when we were talking in preparation for this, I asked if there was a song that came to you or helped you through this period of time. You said there was. Yeah, and Did it's that song it? that I just referenced um, that, um, you know, if you think about what those words say, we who, be we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We believe, believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. And I just think that that song and it was written many years ago. So the fact that things haven't changed is even more like sort of um, sad, but I agree with you that the, um, the, what we've seen not only here in, in the America, but around the world right now about this is, is heartening. So I, I um, it's kind of hard. This is, I love the song and I'll sing part of it, um, but it's not the same without the, um, lovely harmonies of um, the Sweet Understood. Honey and the Rock um, uh, um, quartet part, but, um, but I'll do my best here with it. Yeah. Um, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Until the killing of a black man, black mother's son, is as important as the killing of white men, white mother's son. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Oh, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Oh, let's go back into silence for a moment.
You know, Lisa, it's so amazing. Um, I did a conversation with Erwin uh, Keller, a rabbi, um, and he sang during the conversation. And um, I did another one with Diana Lindsay, who started Healing Circles Langley and Healing Circles Global, and she sang. And sometimes I sing, though I'm not a good singer. <laughs> but there's, there's something about <clears throat> the way in which poetry or song drop us into a place within ourselves that is so much harder to access with words alone, you know. And I think of it as dropping us into soul. That's my experience of it, that, you know, my sort of map of the human psyche is that we all have personalities that we develop in the course of our lifetimes, but behind the personality is a soul. And the soul is our true being. And really the work of the second half of life is to rediscover the soul that shines so purely when we were born and when we were babies before we developed this construct of our personality. And then <clears throat> we become identified with the personality, but behind the personality, yearning to be seen and yearning to be the source from which we live rather than living from the personality is the soul. And there is something about poetry and song that enable us to drop into that space. And each time you have sung for us, it drops me into that place, you know? Oh, I think that's so right, Michael. And as I said, um, as uh, the period during that time with George Floyd, I was really um, and just deeply felt that I'm a very empathic person too. So I think I was feeling not only my pain, but I was feeling a lot of other people's pain. It's just kind of how I am. And, and it was listening to music. I also didn't do some of my normal self-care things that week. And I was watching way too much TV. And, but that following week, I just immersed myself in music. You're absolutely right. I just immersed myself in music, which is sort of my normal no practice, but I got really gotten out of it. And, and I could mm -hmm. feel my spirit renew. I could feel that. And, and that's, I, I, that, that takes me right back there. So when I'm having a day like that, I go right to music. And mm -hmm. I think others I know who are artists and other, like, you, and I think that's why what we do is we center what, and you're, you know, that's why the arts and this is so important because it takes us to, that soul place, it takes us to that sacredness of, in within us. And I know sometimes we're all afraid to tap that part of us, but um, it's there and it's so important. And I'm so glad you mentioned the arts more broadly because that's where Barbara was. Barbara was an artist and a painter and a sculptor. Um, I have one of her sculptings in the room with me uh, when she was very close to death, I went to visit her um, and um, she took and she told me to pick one of her sculptings uh, and I, I, I remember her with it forever. You know, Barbara for me was really like a sister. Uh, we had a really, really deep connection and relationship and um, and she was a very extraordinary woman who lived with a great deal of pain physical and psychological pain, and her ability to, but she was also profoundly mystical. Um, in fact, one of the things she always said was that one of her hopes for me was that I would discover the truth that the soul survives death. Mm. She said, uh, because she knew it, and she always hoped that I would come to know it. And I have to say, I think I've kind of come to know it. Uh, you know, I don't know it for a fact like fact, but 36 years of doing the Cancer Hub program, I've had way too many experiences of connections and visits from those who have departed. Um, 
that I really can't deny my experiential sense of that. Do you believe the soul survives death? Absolutely. Yeah. I absolutely do. Yeah. Do you believe it or do you know it? I, both, I think. I, I, I definitely believe it. And I, th- I, I know that, um, I think, you know, we talked about this during my interview and um, mm-hmm. many of my friends are on, so they know this too. But I've, I've lost all my, I could say my three parents. I've lost all three parents and several other. Mm-hmm. Um, my father died when I was 19. My mom died almost 10 years ago from ovarian cancer. And, mm-hmm. and my stepfather passed away coming up on three years ago. And um, I, but I know they're all still with me and I feel that um, in, a, in, a, in a real way. And, um, and so I, I do believe that they're all still here. And, and when you mentioned getting visits, I, I, I know that there are certain moments where I'm like, okay, mom, I got it. Like, I, like something mm-hmm. happens and I know that that was her, mm-hmm. like saying something to me or maybe it'll come out of a, you know, um, so I, I absolutely believe that. And I, and I think in certain moments I can, f- I can feel their presence, you know, in certain moments. So I, I do believe that. What was your mom like? Oh my gosh. She was the best. My mom, my mom was the nicest human being I have ever met. Mm. Um, my parents both were born in Kentucky. She was a Southern, she was just this really sweet Southern woman. She had the spirit about her and she was, um, she just was the kindest person, really loving. And, um, we certainly had our moments. Mm-hmm. I won't get into my teenage years, Ooh, <laughs> boy. but, um, anyway, um, but I'm really grateful that we had a wonderful, we had a wonderful relationship and, um, she taught me so much and, and she was my biggest cheerleader and I still hear her. Like I would, you know, I, I was, you know, I'm an only child. Um, I have step siblings, but I was her only child. And I would just say, I'm going to go do these things. And she was like, I don't even know whose daughter you are because I would never do that. But <laughs> you, you go ahead and do that. And, um, and she was, and she was so proud of me. Like I would come home. She lived in, I live here. She grew up in Pittsburgh. So that's where she's, um, from. And I think there's somebody on from Pittsburgh. So yay, the Berg. Um, <laughs> and, but when I come home to visit and I go meet her, some of her friends, like all she talks about is you, all she talks about is you and what you're doing. And, mm. um, you know, but I learned a lot from both my parents about work, about not even just about work, but about showing up and feeling good about what you're doing, but, but being kind, um, you know, being genuine. Um, yeah. Was it your father or your stepfather that was the primary influence in your life? You know, I, I look a bit of both. My, my dad, since my dad died was when I was 19, but he, but he and I were really, really close. And I look just like him. Mm. Like I look just like him. And so, um, but he, he, he was quiet, um, but a strong spirit at the same time. And I think people underestimated that and, and people do that with me. Like, I think I can be um, quiet and kind of um, reserved but, um, but when I do speak up, people are usually like, oh, wait a minute, we should maybe pay attention. I think I get a, um, a little bit and I'm just like that. Mm. But he was a big influence on me and really opened my eyes to a broader world. My dad, my dad was a chef at an um, Italian restaurant, but he worked his way up from dishwasher to um, being the head chef at this restaurant until he had a stroke and he had to stop working. Um, but he taught me a lot about showing up um, and, and working and, and just, you know, your work is what Matt, you know, you do a good job every day. It's do the best you can. Um, and, but he would say, speak what you have to say, but choose your words carefully. Like just a lot of really important lessons that I have, um, taken to heart. And, um, and he also was navigate and he, and he exposed me to different kinds of foods and different kinds of people. Um, like I would go with him to some, um, the restaurant had like season tickets to Steeler games. And so as a kid, I would go to these Steeler games with him and his friends. Um, and so I was just around a lot of different people and experienced a lot of different things, which I think really were, was, was helpful to me later because I got exposed to different foods, but also just different people. And, um, and I think as a woman of color out in the broader world, it was good that he kind of got me out there 
And so I was exposed to different people, different races, different cultures kind of early. Mm. That was good. Were they, were your mother and dad church people or not? Oh, yes. I was practically almost born at church. Um, mm. My mom also sang in the choir um, and my dad, we were, they were very active at the church when I grew up and my mom went in the labor, but she thought she had indigestion. I was born premature. I was early. Mm-hmm. So she didn't think it could be labor. And so I guess there was that con there's, and if anyone who's grown up, grown up in the black church, especially you go in the morning and then you stay for food and then there's afternoon, like you were there all day, some days. And so this is one of those days or they've stayed all day. And finally, her stomach pains weren't getting better. So they finally thought they should go to the hospital. And lo and behold, I was a couple of months early. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. What, what were you like as a little girl? Oh, dear. Um, I was a, um, I was a, I was very quiet. I mean, I took one thing about being an only child. I, I was very independent, um, very self-sufficient. My, both my parents worked. I mean, you know, so I was home alone a lot. Um, what was your mom and, doing? Well, my, my mom, um, once I got to school age, she, she stayed at home until I got to be, I think, seven, eight or nine-ish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then when I was in school full time, she was like, she went to, she went to, took her, she went to technical school and got a, um, I don't know if it was associate's degree. I don't know what kind of mm-hmm. degree it was, but, mm-hmm. but she became a food service um, supervisor manager. Mm-hmm. And so she worked, then got a job at a, one of the local hospitals, actually the hospital I was born at. And then mm-hmm. she stayed on there for like 25 years until mm-hmm. she retired. Um, so, so they were both, b- both of your parents were in the food food industry. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Food was kind of important in mm-hmm. in our in our world. Yeah, mm-hmm. and um, and so I would so I was home a lot, and so I was just pretty self. I was just like taking care of things. Um, mm-hmm. but I was an avid reader. Um, I loved music. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I um, and so I just was. Um, but I was I was quirky might be the right word for it. Um, I was sort of not into some of the things all my friends was, were into. I was kind of into other things. Like I was into different kinds of music than my friends were listening to. I was, I was always a little bit like off the beaten path of, mm. of things. Um, but I also had a loyal, but I also had um, um, a group of friends. I was definitely not, you know, one of the popular kids. I was kind of one of the, like, I don't want to say outcast kids, but you know how there are things in, mm-hmm. when you mm-hmm. grow up and there are, there are, people there are like different sectors or whatever and Mm -hmm. so I I, but I had a crew of friends um but I you know I was into sports not I'm not an athlete by any means but I loved Mm -hmm. sports I was I was into politics like I was just into all these things that maybe seemed a little more adult and I think that's partly because I was an only child you froze your image froze that could be me am I back yeah, oh, yeah, you're back for me. Thanks. Okay. All right. So you're um, into sports and I was into sports. I was into politics. Like I was just into different sorts of things. Um, and I think part of that's being an only child. And I was exposed to a lot of adults a lot. And I hung out like when my parents had friends over. I was just around too. Not that I didn't have friends my age, but I just think I had interests that were different than other mm-hmm. maybe what other people were were talking about and, and and into. So what were you like in eighth grade? Oh, Lordy, eighth grade, eighth grade. God, my memory is not that great, but let me well, think about eighth grade. Just before you started high school, think about it. Oh, okay, that before high school. Um, before high school, um, I, um, like I grew up in the 80s, right? So I was definitely into um music in in but all the new wave like all this music from england like i was totally obsessed with anything that was going on in london like like i was obsessed with mm-hmm. with with the english and the music over there and all that stuff and um you know but i was also um really interested in journalism and communication so i was um involved in our high school my school paper like i really wanted to pursue um that kind of work so i was very curious and i liked and and so I was writing a lot. Um, I definitely have a more of a creative bent. Um, and so I was writing and doing a lot of things like that um, mm-hmm. at that time. Yeah. And what about as a senior in high school or before? 
senior in high school, senior year in high school was a, was a weird year. My dad had just, my dad had a stroke my senior year. And so it was, and so, and I was thinking about colleges and, and I really had dreams of leaving Pittsburgh um, and going away. And my mom definitely had other ideas about me leaving and going away. And then my dad got sick and had the stroke in the middle of it. And so it was, it was, was, a, hard it was, year. It was a hard year because mm-hmm. I was still like, I want to go. And I got accepted at a school where I ended up, I ended up going um, to Michigan state up in East Lansing. And, but I was, um, but there was a lot of like, ah, maybe I shouldn't do this because dad's not well. And there was a whole mm-hmm. lot of angst that year about that decision. And, but you did go there. Ultimately I did go there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They, my, my mom was like, not pleased with the idea, but my dad yet always mm-hmm. my dad to be my, um, my, you know, my guy was like, Mm -hmm. if this is where she wants to go and she got accepted, Mm -hmm. she should go. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. And so what were you like your last year of college? Oh my goodness. The last year of college, um, I was really, um, college, ended and it was like well, what do you do now <laughs> like I know you're supposed to get a job and do all these mm-hmm. things but but it was sort of like but no one really tells you I shouldn't say no one tells you how to do it because I think they do like you can get your resume together and you go on these interviews um, and do all these things but but I was also trying to break into I, I majored in communications and I really want to work in tv and it was like how do you do that but I had done all these internships and so I had actual experience and things I could show, but I was definitely not clear about how this was all going to work. And I moved back to Pittsburgh and I definitely, after being gone for almost four years, like, like I didn't really, you know, it was like, how am I going to do this here? And so I was, and so I was, I was excited yet fearful at the same time Mm because I just didn't know how things were going to work and what Mm -hmm. was going to happen. Um, but, um, and I was just so ecstatic to actually graduate. And, and it was hard. I mean, after my dad died my sophomore year. And so, and, and, I, and I thought then, okay, I'm packing up, I'm coming back home, or I'm gonna come back closer because it's expensive to go to school out of state. Mm-hmm. Um, but my mom was like, no, you already got two years in, like we'll make this work. And, and again, my mom, like, of course, like always like, we will make this work. We're gonna do what you, we can, for, I'm gonna, I'm, we're gonna make this work. And, so I, but that meant I took out some additional loans. I was already working. I started working a little more at my job and to make some of the financials work and we figured it out, but yeah. So yeah. clearly from your description, you had two parents who uh, were really committed to your becoming who you wanted to be. Yeah. and. Yeah. Yeah. And you were, you were really committed to doing the work in every way, shape, and form that you could. And, and I, I, yeah, I, I think I had two parents that just showed me very every day, like yeah. they they valued the, you know, I grew up. Pittsburgh is like a Pittsburgh is a working class, working class. Even the right word. Pittsburgh is a city of people who they show up. And they do what they're going to do. Like it's it's one thing you learn there is like you work, you do a good job, you have a lot of fun, you root for pits, you st- the Steelers, the Pirates, and the and the Penguins, of course, or otherwise, you know, you're mm-hmm. not a Pittsburgher at all. Right, but um, right. but you but there's a but there's a sense of a work ethic that you're sort of instilled with, and my parents exemplified that to me. Like the fact that my dad started as the dishwasher and worked his way up to. Um, you know, the head chef just showed me like things are possible. You know, mm-hmm. my mom going back to school and, you know, and working, then working for years mm-hmm. um, at a job that she loved and, and she helped train other people. Like that was just really instilled in me that if you show up and do, um, do a good job, you know, do your job as your, you know, that you will be, that that, that speaks for you. You know, like you, you don't have to, you don't have to say a lot of things and, and have billboard signs about yourself. Just 
let your work speak for, th for you. And that's really what I try to do um, every day is like, you know, I'm pretty shy. Like you asking me to do this is even like, well, what? Like, you mm -hmm. know, um, but, you know, I've just tried to let me and my work speak for me or just, you know, that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. You know, you mentioned Pittsburgh being a working class town and, and I, I just have, for all my life, I've had such resonance to whatever you want to call working class people, you know, it's not that that's how I grew up, but for some karmic reason, I've just always had such respect and I don't know, deep gratitude. I mean, it almost brings tears to my eyes, but just such a deep resonance for what you're describing your parents were like and what Pittsburgh is like, you know, and I just, so anyway, what you're saying moves me a lot just because, um, I don't know, I just born with that resonance, you know, yeah. born with that resonance. Um, so um, I want to ask you about your experience of whatever you call God or the divine in your life. Um, you've been a church person a lot of your life, I guess. But how does the experience of whatever you pray to or worship, whatever you call it, how does it touch your life? That's a really good question. I, I think um, you can be a church person person and, and not have any connection whatsoever to yeah. that spirit, higher power, God, whatever you want right. to call it. Um, and, and I will admit that for many years, I was that person. I was there every Sunday and I'm dependable and I'm, I'm like sitting there in my pew and I'm reading my stuff. And, and there wasn't that connection, which I knew I wanted. I saw it in other people. And I was like, I don't quite know you know, what to do here. And it's, and it's, and, and I realized that I think some of it is that self, for me, it was that like reliance on self-sufficiency and that some of it's an only child thing that I was still kind of like, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to, I'm going to really do it. And then I would pray for like, help me, help me, you know, but it wasn't until I kind of really realized that like, I'm not, I'm, I really need help. And I don't have any peace. And so I'm really going to just really lean into and surrender to this, this God or this power. And, and when I started really doing that and really admitting that I don't even know what I'm trying to do. So I'm just going to wait and let you show me. And that's when things started to change for me. And I get this real deep connection, you know, to have a spiritual practice around meditation and, and quiet time and, and real prayer that's just more earnest from the heart. Like, you know, I think, I think for me, it was a mental thing instead of a heart thing. And when I finally started leading from the heart is when I started getting that connection and mm -hmm. really, and, and for me, that's what started to, to have this piece of me that I feel is really more rooted and grounded in that. Um, and so, and so I think now I can, and I can really lead from that place and that's, really where I lead most things from um, and take great th um, thought and decisions. And, you know, even before this today, I was just like, please use me and help me be of service and help me speak from the heart with Michael today. And that's, that's really what I lead with. And I think when I'm doing that, that taps into that, that spirit of that power. Yeah. When did that change take place? Um, Probably, I would say like some, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years, 10, about 20 years ago, um, I was just in some, I had made some decisions that weren't really great. Um, work is a, um, work, the work I was doing, I should put it that way. And, and I've worked for some amazingly um, people in, who are doing amazing things in, in, the, in the world. And, and I really started to let that work overtake me. And I just finally had to realize that 
I needed to try to take myself back. Like I needed to try to, like I was losing myself in that the work had become more important than everything else. Um, and it's wonderful, wonderful to be mission led. And, and I feel that way about the work we do at Smith Center. And I'm sure you feel that way as well. But, but there's a way where you, but I was losing me in there in the process. And so um, had to just started to have to say like, wait a minute and, and made some changes, sort of made a career change, like realized that the, the politics, some of the things I was doing just wasn't, wasn't where I needed to be. And, and then God just really led me through this other path. And I think this is really this work that started when I got the job at Faster Cures and then Biden Cancer now here. This is really my, my, my soul's work. And I think that really helped. But I think all those other things I did prepared me so well for this work. So mm. nothing happens by accident. And how do you experience, like you, you, you've surrendered to this power of God, the divine, whatever, and you've asked for help. How do you experience it in your daily life or in your weekly or monthly life? Like what kind of, what's the, what's, what's it like? What's the feeling or the, how does it work yeah. that you experience that? You know, it's, it's, I don't know about other people, but, um, when I'm not doing something that's kind of in alignment or an agreement, um, my body tells me that mm -hmm. I, I feel, I feel discomfort. Mm -hmm. I feel a, my stomach is in a knot or I have this tension in my body. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, I'm often like, what's going on? What's, what's happening? This, this is something's not, Right. And so then I'll start going back. Like, did I just say something that maybe I shouldn't? Did I just do something? You know, it, or if I've made a decision, I'm like, hmm, maybe I need to revisit that because that's not sitting, it's not fitting well in my body now. Mm -hmm. Like something about it doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so that's kind of how it plays out for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and so in my daily life, um, if I have a decision to make or, you know, or, or just like, I'm, I'm, I'm constant, I'm sort of constantly in this, hmm, guidance would be appreciated. Like, you know, like mm -hmm. I'm constantly sort of checking in and just like, mm -hmm. does this feel right? Does this feel right? Is, I mean, that mm -hmm. doesn't feel right. I better sit with that some more. And I really try to just wait, like, you know, it's a, if I don't quite know what to do or what to say, I just wait. Mm -hmm. Um, because the guidance usually comes. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just, so, and then when I do something that's not the thing I should say or do, like, like I, I know pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, beautiful. So what's it been like taking on Smith Center? You're how many months into it now? It's about to be seven or is it eight? Wait, seven, eight. Yeah, one of those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Seven or eight months in. You didn't expect to be leading Smith Center through COVID and through Black Lives Matter. And Yay all me, of, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what's, yeah. what's it been like? Oh my gosh. It's, I mean, it, it's, it's been amazing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, is, as I said before, the, the team of people at Smith Center and a lot of them are on Julia and Allie and Kirsten and Michelle and, Carla and Lindsay um, and Tammy and Laura, like just, um, I think I got everybody. Joanna, if I missed you, I'm sorry. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just, it's an amazing group of people and, and they have been so welcoming. And, if, and, the, and of course the board has been awesome. And I know you know many of the board members as well. And, um, you know, any new job is like drinking from the fire hose. And so, you know, so the fire hose was on um, and, and I will say that Smith Center has the most amazing onboarding system I have ever experienced. And I've been in many jobs in many places and I have never been onboarded in the way I was here. Mm -hmm. And so kudos to the team for that. I know how much work goes into it, mm -hmm. um, but it was immensely helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's just learning, you know, I mean, I, I knew a lot about, you know, I've worked in the cancer, I've worked, 
you know, in this world, but I've worked, but I was working at it at the, you know, 800 foot level, which is great. And I think I have a really good understanding um, of, of, of all of that. What made, what makes this job, this I mean a job to me, what makes Smith Center so special and this role so special is I get to really think about like the people who are being impacted. And that's what was driving me in the other roles too, but I'm, I'm just thrilled to sort of be able to really think about how can we help? How can we serve in this, in this moment? Um, and I was, and so I was just, you know, three getting into January, February, March, and the fire hose was starting to feel a little less crazy. And I was starting to feel a little more settled. And then here came COVID. And so then it was like, oh, okay. And now we have to close. And now how do we get everything on virtual? And how do we make sure we stay, uh, how do we make sure we stay here, um, that everyone stays employed? But most importantly, how do we make sure we serve people? Because now they're already dealing with the hardest thing they've ever gone through in their lives and their families and the caregivers amongst them. And now they're in the middle of a pandemic. So their lives are already, they already were living in this moment of knowing they're immunosuppressed and things they can and can't do. And now this is happening. So there's lo- things get even smaller and even harder. And so it was just like, how do we keep serving and being here for those people, even if they can't cross the doors um, physically at U Street, but how do we bring U Street to them? And so, um, you know, it's been, a, um, it's been a sprint, like, like just to catch up and, and there's so much to learn. There's so much to think about. Um, it's, it's a lot, but I, I wouldn't want to be doing any other thing right now either. Well, as you know, we've been going through the same thing at Commonweal with Orange Slosberg's leadership and um, bringing a lot of our programs online. And some of it is fairly straightforward. Other parts of it have been really challenging. Our healing circles work, uh, which you also do, um, is going really well online. You know, one of the things uh, that I think is true is that a lot of the people who work hands-on in deep healing work have often had a suspicion that it's hard to do deep healing work online. They, 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 they often aren't drawn to it automatically. Some people are, but a lot of people aren't. I was certainly one of the ones that was not drawn to it. But then when you begin to get into it and say to yourself, okay, you know, it's, we can't do the face-to-face work that we've done for 36 years right now. So what do we have? We have the online work and the healing is still necessary. So let's explore. And then you begin to explore and you realize that, you know what, actually very deep work can be done online. And in some ways, I mean, there are losses, but there are also benefits because people don't have to get in a car and travel to a center. Uh, You know, it's much more accessible in many ways. You can reach more people. So there are all those pieces. Um, And and we find they work well for healing circles and uh, for some other things. But now I'm trying to figure out how to bring the Cancer Health Program online, which is an intensive week-long program. And let me tell you, it's not easy to figure no. out. It's, it's not really easy not. to figure out. Yeah, in fact, we're trying to start our first uh, online, uh, we're calling it sanctuary, is what we're calling the Cancer Health Program online. And um, we have seven women with breast cancer. Actually, I'm going to be speaking to them for the second time this afternoon from across the United States and Canada. and. Um, Man, and you know what I'm doing is rather than going to them with a fixed format and saying, this is what we're going to do, I'm asking them how we can serve them. I'm saying, okay, you know, we know how to do healing circles, but how do we do this? And taking guidance from them about, you know, is an intensive week the best or should we spread it over two weeks or three weeks or four weeks? And how much time can you spend on Zoom yeah. in the course of a day without getting Zoom burnout is up? real. Zoom yeah. burnout is real. 
So basically what I'm thinking right now as I go into this conversation with them this afternoon is I'm going to suggest that we just limit ourselves to 90 minutes on Zoom, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, you know, which is, uh, you know, it's a light schedule. But then rather than thinking of it as a week or two weeks or three weeks, that we're inviting people into a community of healing where there will be, in effect, an onboarding process that starts with a smaller group. Um, but that um, after that onboarding process takes place, we create an online community where people can pick and choose the different pieces that really serve them. So the online community becomes, I mean, they, they bond first in the small group, but then the online community becomes the space where people can find each other and share. So I'm just curious, what, I'm just telling you, you know, I think in some ways, so interesting, you know, Commonweal, we've done, I don't know, whatever it is, 220 week-long cancer health programs. But uh, I'm curious what you uh, and your staff are learning from what works best and what works less well in moving online. Yeah, you know, we've... we've um... We definitely are learning learning a lot, and, and but we're also seeing some some really positive responses. But but I think you're absolutely right in going to them first and asking what they might need. Um, mm -hmm. And what we're seeing, at least with with our community, is I think they because because there were some relationships that have been built with the staff. I think we're seeing that people people kind of want more of 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 that, and so we've actually created some um, new programming um, as ways to connect with people, uh, which, I, which I think people are finding um, a, a nice way to, to do it. We have something called, we've, we, um, Kirsten and Carla started Tea in Conversation, which is like an, on our, every couple of Fridays, we get together with whoever wants to come on and hang out with us over tea if you want or water whatever you're drinking mm -hmm. and we just mm -hmm. chat like there's no mm -hmm. there's no top like we just we're just talking with any mm -hmm. of our community you want to come on with any of the staff and they could talk with each other and because i think what people are longing for right now is that community mm -hmm. is that connection and and so we're just trying to create more spaces for for that to happen um we too are, are trying to you know, we're, we're, the healing circles are, are going well virtually, support groups as well, um, and, and, and people are coming to those things. But we're also seeing people um, really wanting just sort of more informal spaces too. And so that's mm -hmm. something that we're trying to, I think we've been able to sort of be trying to be responsive to that. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're also cognizant about Zoom burnout and just how long, how, how much is too much. And, and so it's it's those sorts of, those sorts of lessons I think are important. Um, but we're, but we also, but I think the thing that we're, what I know what they've learned a lot is that you almost need to build extra time for connection after the sessions. Cause people mm -hmm. don't want to get off the zoom, you know, because they want to stay on and chat just like they would have stayed on at Smith center afterward and talked you know, either to each other or to Carla or to Kirsten or Lindsay, like they would have still been there. And so there's, so I think there's that need to, again, to not, not in the connection, um, which we now know can happen virtually. I think we were all worried, like it's not exactly the same, but it's definitely possible mm -hmm. to, to, to build that. Yeah, there are things, when I talked to Janie Brown from Kalanish, who has led the cancer health program in Vancouver, British Columbia for well over 20 years and is really a genius in the work. And she talks about how what you have and what you don't have. So, you know, you have the visual image and the voice. You don't have touch. You don't have taste. You don't have smell. Uh, uh, you know, as you've said, one person can sing, but you can't sing together, right? So there are all these things that you lose, right? Which are very much a part of it, being in the room together, the physical sensations, 
you've traveled some distance to be there because you means that much to you. So there are all those things that create investment and depth and you know total sensory connection. And then you're in your home, you know, cut off with everything from everything except the Zoom screen and the, the voices. But what are the things that are added, you know? So what's added is that uh, you can do this more often if you want. It, your investment, the amount of time it takes to click on a URL and go to something is moments. And so if you're not zoomed out or stressed out and something really matters to you, um, it's easy to get there, you know? And, yeah. and the other thing I've learned both in and personal Zoom calls are not just Zoom. I, I really feel that we should think about the fact that because people get Zoomed out, doesn't mean that they wouldn't want to be on a call, you know. So the fact, that, or, or FaceTime, I mean, FaceTime is interesting to me because it's so much more intimate than, yes. than Zoom is. It is. And so it just seems to me that to explore all these different things. So for example, if you're doing a meditation thing, uh, some people might just want to hear the uh, teacher's voice and, you know, not see. So I'm just thinking, how do we explore all of these different modalities and learn to blend them together? That's right. I think I, I know that none of us, I think, would hope that COVID would happen and that we'd be in these situations. But I think there are so many wonderful I think there are going to be less, there are lessons that we're learning. And I think we've all, this is also, I know going virtual for us has opened the door for some people who from, from whatever reason couldn't join us, you know, at, on U Street now are participating. And some people that had relocated um, and missed Smith Center are reconnecting because they can now virtually. Mm -hmm. And, and so you know, whatever happens that the other big decision right now is what happens, when do we reopen? And I'm sure you all are trying to figure all that stuff out too. And, but we know that the virtual aspects of our work are going to continue because there's a, there's a, it, it does fill a need um, for, for some people. And we want to continue to, to fill that need for those that can't, mm -hmm. that yeah. can't come. So, yeah, but I think we do have to explore all the various um, realms of what technology brings us. And I think that there are some gifts and some losses as you, mm -hmm. as you put yeah. it so well. Yeah. You have that beautiful roof garden and you also have that uh, external space uh, in the middle of the building. Yes. And so given the growing amount of data that the virus can hang out in indoor air, uh, it may well be that those outdoor places within Smith Center may turn out to be very valuable. Absolutely, yeah. We're in it. We're, we have a um, uh, we have a committee that's board and staff that's looking at um, like these issues. Um, Oren is um, on it because he's one of our wonderful board members, and he's lending his expertise here too. And um, and so we're looking at all options, and we actually have done a survey to the community to get their thoughts on what would mean for them to come back and what, what are they thinking? How are they feeling? And, and as well as one for the staff, because I need to think about, you know, them too. It's not, I mean, we need to make a decision about our community, but we also have to make a decision about our staff. And so this is, this is a compli it's complicated um, to, to think through and we have to think, but everyone's safety, everyone's safety has to come first. But you're right, yeah. us having that out, those outdoor spaces is going to be a godsend. Mm -hmm. And not only is it complicated with COVID and with the whole set of uh, racial uh, tensions, it's complicated with the fact that COVID, the racial question, and of course what's happened to the economy, which is completely devastating to people. But then we're going to move into a fall where regardless of where you are in the political spectrum, the, it's gonna be a very, very, very difficult period of time, you know, the next uh, five or six months. And who knows if it ends there. So we've moved into this new world, right? COVID isn't gonna leave anytime soon. 
you know, there's not going to be a vaccine available to everybody anytime soon. The, the medical treatments are getting better, thank God. They're learning more and more about, you know, both how to reduce, uh, uh, you know, the acute uh, cases. Um, I think what's still profoundly overlooked is integrative medical approaches to um, uh, to uh, to this, which Laura Pohl, who's on the Smith Center staff and the Commonwealth staff of Beyond Conventional Cancer Therapies, is really leading a lot of pulling all that information together. Yes. And to me, that is vital because there's evidence-based and evidence-informed data that shows that healthy lifestyle plus informed supplements and you know embodied practices like yoga or qigong all these things together they make you less likely to get the virus and far more likely to have a more mild case if you do get it that's right and, and to me it's unbelievable and yet so typical of the united states and much of the world that all the focus is on what you can do medically or social distancing, wash your hands and, you know, and stay away from crowds. And nobody talks about how you build this inner shield of strength, which, I mean, the United States has ignored this stuff for forever, right? And we're still ignoring it. Yeah, they're still ignoring it. Yeah. yeah. So it seems to me we have such a useful role to play in simply saying to people, you know, uh, go to the Commonweal website or bcct.ngo or whatever, and look up what you can do for yourself with COVID. That's know? right. One of the th new things that we started, I shouldn't say we, because it was really um, Kirsten and Carla, I'm going to give credit where credit is due on our team. They started a new newsletter that's going out to our community that's all about different resources and information. And a lot of it's around self-care right now and what you could be doing to strengthen your soul, strengthen your physical body, but also your um, inner core, your inner mm -hmm. spirit, like all those sorts of resources. And I've been sharing to my broader friend community on social media and others, everything that we do. And I've had a lot of my friends start doing Smith Center yoga classes and other things because they're, I, you know, I've been talking to them about how important these things are, but I, think, but I think people are starting to understand that there's more they could be doing to help themselves. But I think you're right. And I think that's why it's so important that organ, people, the Commonwealth exists, that Smith Center exists, and all the other um, allies that we have, that we really talk more about this. Because um, the kind of self-care resources that we, we know work um, could just be, should be amplified right now. And and they're just getting drowned out. Um, but right now, everything's getting drowned out by all the noise that exists, mm -hmm. unfortunately. All the noise. And you know what's really interesting? People on both sides of the spectrum and in the middle are all depressed by it. It's not as if one side is depressed and the other is feeling good. Everybody's depressed by it. And so there's this level of anxiety, depression, so on and so forth. And guess what? coming together in community and practicing meditation, yoga, qigong, doing healing circles, taking care of yourself, these things help. You know, yeah. we're just living in this era and, and it's, it's not looking like it's going to let up anytime soon, you know. So how do we strengthen our capacity to build healing community and create a network of, you know, Oren works with a network of, I think it's 40 retreat centers, or in Slasburg, 40 retreat centers around the country. And, and so those retreat centers with Oren's leadership are asking these same questions. So it just seems to me that the, the healing communities, the retreat center communities, the spiritual communities, the church communities, how do we all come together in this brave new world that we are living in uh, to find humanity together and to reclaim our capacity to talk with each other and to just find the soul space that is beyond all the politics and stuff where we can really, you know, when we do cancer health programs, you know this, 
We don't check people's political credentials at the door. You know, it's not what we do. We're no, about same healing. Smith Center. We just come yeah. in the door. Like we're not come in the door. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So there's so much power in that, and it's so much so needed. So it just seems really how vital what you are uh, doing is at Smith Center. You know how vital. Yeah, yeah. it's 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 important, um, and I think it's important that we are in D.C. Um, and that we can and we can be that voice, and we are working in with different organizations and building some new relationships and then trying to expand our reach so people know that we're there and they yeah. can tap into the resources that we offer. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So what haven't I asked you that you would like to mention before we begin to do a close? Anything oh, else? Yeah. Michael, you've asked me so many things. I, um, <laughs> let's see, what, what haven't we talked about? Um, um, one thing I would, um, back to some of the George Floyd and some of those things, uh, I'm sure that many of the people here are, are you know, really doing their own deep soul searching and, and looking at some things. And I would just encourage you to, to, to do that. But um, if you have um, friends of color and people in your life, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to check on them, but just let them know you're there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, just let them know that you're there. Um, mm. right now and, and, um, and really work to be that ally, mm-hmm. right. Um, in, in, a, in real ways. I think say that's. More, say more about how, in addition to letting them know you're there, you said work to let them to, to be allies. Say more about how people can. Yeah. I, you know, I, um, cause I think that right now, and this is what I think we're all sort of waiting to see, like right now it's, 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 Everyone's really committed to it, but this is this isn't this is going to be a long haul process. Mm-hmm. I mean, these these is four hundred years of, mm-hmm. of of white of supremacy and and systemic racism. Like this is we, this is going to be a slow roll thing. Um, but if you really want to do the work and you really want to be an ally, you're going to have to you're going to have to call things out when you see it. You're going to have to speak up and back people up when you see things happening. You know, it's those little, it's, it's those side conversations that happen where things are discussed that are maybe demeaning toward a person and you just sit there and nod and don't speak up, even though you're uncomfortable. We need you to speak up. Like we need to call things out. We need to, we need to, we need to just, we can't keep not letting the light shine on it. That's why it's endured for so long. Mm-hmm. You know, so I just encourage people to stay encouraged and, um, but we gotta, we gotta fight the fight. Like we gotta keep up the work. You know, could you uh, lead us out with a song? Yes, I can. I have one for you that I thought would be appropriate. And it was wonderful because you brought up the cancer program and that you're calling it Sanctuary. And it came to me um, yesterday that there's a lovely song about Sanctuary. So I thought we could um, end with that. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. For you, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Let's go into silence for a moment. Lisa Sims Booth, Executive Director of Smith Center for Healing and the Arts.
what a profound joy to be with you this morning of the learning community of the new school. Michael, it was a, a delightful to be here with you. Yeah. And I'm so grateful. Kira has just put up the little link to making a donation for the learning community. Uh, we love you all and are so grateful uh, if you can contribute what you might spend on a Starbucks coffee or something like that, put it on your credit card as a continuing donation. That's really special. And um, Lisa, this has just been so beautiful. Oh, it's been very fun. Yeah, it's been beautiful. You know, um, Diana Lindsay also sang the sanctuary song when we did our conversation. So it, it, it may be something we do repeatedly. And Julia Rowland, bless your soul for being on. And such a, a friend of so many years and such a, a leader in the Smith Center community and yes, she such is. A, a beloved beloved friend. It's so, a delight uh, to work with Julia yeah. and, and the team. Yeah. And Kirsten and all of all the whole team. Uh, Kirsten has been such a, a wonderful contributor and so engaged with the Healing Circles work. So, yes. um, so bless you all. You can just tune in any Friday and you will probably discover that um, there are, is somebody lovely uh, with us. So uh, again, Lisa, it's a blessing. I'm sure we will ask you to come back again. And um, anytime, Michael, I'd be yeah. delighted. All right.